I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remain utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain, they rush about heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth. For you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. When you rebuke and discipline anyone for their sin, you consume their wealth like a moth. Surely everyone is but a breath. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Do not be deaf to my weeping. I dwell with you as a foreigner, a stranger, as all my ancestors were. Look away from me, that I may enjoy life again, before I depart and am no more. Well, good morning. It's good to see you here. And uh, we call this a bad hair day, so no judgment here. Not that anybody looks bad. Some of you would look good with hair, maybe, but, uh, but uh, I'm just kidding. But anyway, hey, we're glad everybody's here. I'd like to welcome our guest. And, uh, and we're glad everybody's here this morning. And just want to make a few announcements as we begin. Don't forget, Wednesday night we have service. We have uh, uh, New Life uh, uh, Kids, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. Quest for Christ is an afternoon. New Life Kids and the Pastor Bob speaking in the Book of Daniel on Wednesday night, so you don't want to forget that. Also, a couple things coming up. March the sixth, the choir will have a uh, read through or listen through of the Easter Cantata. Uh, can you believe that? Uh, we're already there. So, if you're interested in that, put that down. That'd be March sixth. Uh, be after church. Talk to Jackie if you have any questions. Uh, for March the 6th. Also today you start signing up for the uh, dinner theater, uh, free dinner theater here at the church, March 18th and 19th, the last voyage of the SS Gigantic. That'll be interesting, shouldn't it? And I want you to sign up, bring friends and guests, and we're doing it two nights. Uh, uh, unless we fill or overfill it, then we'll talk about what we're doing after that. But we encourage you to sign up. Uh, now's the time to do that. Also, just remember our Christmas, uh, Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes, uh, the donations we take year-round for those. And the baby bottle boomerang, uh, I hope you brought your baby bottles back. that We passed out a few weeks ago. Uh, if not, get them in because we're turning them in this week, so get them in by Tuesday if you haven't. And also, a Saturday, by the way, is Carly and Kim's surprise birthday party, which is not a surprise. We've been announcing it that way, so... Uh, uh, so anyway, don't forget that. That's this Saturday here at the church. And uh, on the March the 2nd, our mission night, Devin and Charity, uh, they're back uh, for a, a few weeks. And they, they won't be able to be here on a Sunday, but they'll be here on March the 2nd on a Wednesday night sharing uh, about the, the ministry there in uh, Papua New Guinea. And also when we talk about missions moment this morning, we have a slide to show. Or do we have it? There it is. Uh, we have a ministry at Wilson and on Wednesday uh, we have Quest for Christ. A lot of our people show up to that. It's a, a Christian Bible club after school. But also, uh, we've kind of adopted the school, and we have uh, uh, do special things for them on uh, uh, the in-service uh, meetings of teachers. We uh, give them treats, and uh, Jackie, I believe, uh, got together these treats and took them up last week. 
I believe it was, and they got a note that says the goodies were hit, the boxes uh, were, uh, you know, so pretty. There, one just looked at them, and the environment came later. Please let the church community know how much they are appreciated. So that's just a, a ministry going on of our church. A lot of people might not know about that. Happens every Wednesday. So if you're interested, see uh, uh, see Jackie or Bob about that. And uh, I know many times Bob would take things up. We did Chick Fil A, I believe, one time, didn't we? For a couple, yeah. So you know, we show we appreciate the teachers. It's a ministry to the uh, public schools, and uh, we've adopted one, and that's Wilson School. So I think that's exciting. Amen. Uh, and as we remember our missionaries, Kelly's going to come this time, and uh, and he's going to lead us in prayer as we remember our various missionaries we have in our projects. Yeah. Okay, please join me as we uh, kind of focus on missions here for a few minutes. Thank you, Heavenly Father, gracious God. It uh, we. Just honor your uh, holy name. And Father God, we pray for boldness and we pray for commitment and courage uh, to share the gospel and uh, for the full purpose of bringing more lives uh, to you and just building your kingdom. And Father God, I'm reminded of the 180 Food Pantry at, at Wilson. We're so thankful for that opportunity. And in Iowa, the Salt Network and Light Company, we pray for continued support there. And and for Josh and Steph Collins, and we just pray for uh, comfort there and just let your presence be known to them and bring other opportunities for them to share the gospel. And, and Father God, we do also pray for the persecuted church. And uh, we're so fortunate to have freedom here, uh, but that's not the case everywhere across the world. And we know that there are those that are being persecuted. And we just ask for, for safety and, and peace and comfort for those. Father God, I love you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you all here. Just the way God had it planned, right? Brought us all together this morning. Our, our verse, uh, verses I want to run by you this morning in Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10. The uh, video, isn't it amazing when you talk about uh, the work of God, our, our, our Savior Jesus Christ, how it all kinds of blend together in one book with a beginning and an end, if you know what I mean. So, uh, this uh, Romans uh, 8, 9, and 10. The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith that was proclaimed. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So my prayer today, if anyone within the sound of our music, the voice, the message, don't know Jesus Christ as their personal savior, Today might be the day that God would reveal to you truth, and today might be the first day of the rest of your life, knowing him and following him, and he will bring you into his family as heirs. So listen to our music today. We got a message of salvation this morning through music. Go ahead and stand if you will. Bring our voices together. Stand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But He guides us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die. For we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we. Disappointments have prevailed And we wandered in the darkness Heavy hearted and alone But we're trusting in the Lord And according to His word We will understand it better by and by By and by When the morning comes When the saints 
saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. Temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to plead for some thoughtless word or deed. Wonder why the test when we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better.
God, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for your creation. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that you sent for us before we ever drew a breath of air. You sent your son for us. We thank you for the salvation, the grace that you give us. If anyone here this morning don't know you as their personal Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their heart and their mind, and today would be the first day of the rest of their life knowing you, that you would repent and, and they would acknowledge you as their personal Savior. You would bring them into your family, the inherited of your family. So watch over us, be with Pastor Roger in the message, and Thank you again for the music, the people, the family here that you put together. We owe it all to you, Lord. We take none of it ourselves. What an honor it is to be called a Christian, a follower of Jesus. The blessings just roll out, the grace from our maker, our heavenly father. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We call this Goosebump Sunday, right? That's great singing, guys. Uh, beautiful songs. And I want to just uh, draw your attention to a couple changes in the next few weeks. If, appreciate our, our media guys. Uh, now we have a, uh, a connection uh, in the, in the uh, vestibule area, entranceway, and in the nursery they can watch the service now on video. Before all you could see was the points, so now you can actually see what's going on in here. Appreciate that. And in the next few weeks will be some changes up here. Uh, uh, going to do some uh, updating and remodeling on the platform the church decided a couple months ago to uh, make some changes. And so, but next week when you come in, that wall will be black. I just want to let you know. And this, they're taking down the screens after service today as the project goes on. So we have a week or so with uh, uh, lower technology and uh, little changes. So, so you be aware of that. And, uh, and of course, we'll be singing more familiar songs. So. Uh, you can sing them, you know, just from your memory or grab a hymn book if you need to as we do this project. And so we're excited about the outcome of it and how it's going to turn out. And uh, it's an experiment. If everybody hates it, we can take it down, okay? So uh, we change it. But uh, I think everybody will like it and everything. So uh, remember when we changed from pews to pew chairs? Y'all remember that one? Okay. Along those lines, you know. So anyway, hey, this morning we're in a book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 10. And if you'll turn there, Mark chapter 10, verse 32. We're going to talk about the character of kingdom servanthood this morning uh, from the gospel of Mark. And uh, let's all stand as we look at verse 32 through 45. And uh, we'll go there, and you can follow on the screen, or you can follow in your Bibles. And uh, we'll be getting, uh, by the way, new uh, uh, projectors, uh, which will uh, enhance the ones we have, uh, which are fading out very fast, if some of you haven't noticed. It could be your eyesight, but more than likely it's the, lens, it's, it's, uh, the screen, okay? So uh, beginning in verse 32, it says this. Uh, and they were on the road again, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise." And James and John, the son of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to him, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink uh, the cup uh, or to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with a baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with a baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them in and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. 
But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, and as we look at it this morning, we ask that you teach us from it. Uh, give us clarity, Lord. Give us understanding, and I pray that you would do a spiritual work in our hearts. For those who are not trusting you, may they their eyes be open and they uh, commit in faith to you this morning. And for the believers that are here, help us to realize the key to greatness in your kingdom is to be servant of all, and help us to embrace that and purpose to follow and just do a work in our life may you be glorified in Jesus name amen. amen Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem to fulfill the will of the father for which he came and on this way he took time to teach the disciples a few weeks ago he taught about the spouses about divorce and remarriage he talked about children uh, uh, and then last week we, he talked about money and possessions and this week, we're going to see the believer's relationship with Christ. And in our text this morning, we will see Jesus teaching his disciples that believer's relationship to Christ and his kingdom is one of servanthood. You know, I have always heard that you have to be a good follower before you're a good leader. What's wrong in today's corporate world is you put people in leadership who have never been good followers. They've always been giving orders, and they're terrible leaders because they abuse those they're under. They have no understanding of what they're, they're about. But that's not so in the Lord's kingdom. Uh, followship precedes leadership. If you want to know who makes the best leaders in a church, first of all, find out who are the best followers in the church. They're the ones who are following the Lord, who follow leadership. They make good leaders because they've been there, done that, and they understand that. Joseph, Moses, Joshua, David, Timothy, even our Lord himself, all were followers as leaders. You say, even the Lord, yes. Jesus on earth did what the Father led him to do. So he was led of the Spirit of the Father. He set aside his own, uh, his own glory and came to earth, I guess you could say. Uh, the God-man, he submitted himself to the Spirit, though he did not need to. Uh, he was led by the Spirit as an example for us. He fulfilled and pleased the Father as an example for us. Jesus was the good Father. Lord. And as a result, uh, He is now Lord of all. And He's our Lord. And so we follow Him. And we're to follow Him. And then people are to follow us. Uh, and a good follower is a good leader. Followship precedes leadership. Uh, in our text this morning, we will look at Servanthood in the kingdom, at five characteristics of servanthood in the kingdom, as we learn to be better at followership. Now, that's kind of tough in a day and age when everybody wants to do our own thing, right? We don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to follow. We want to, uh, what's wrong with so many of our generations is, is you know, the generation uh, follows the past generation, but, but that several years ago, it probably was the baby boomers decided they're going to uh, march to the beat of a different drum. Okay, my generation. And as a result of that, you have all kinds of disaster and chaos and rebellion. You know, generations decide they're going to do their own thing. When really, we lose respect for the, 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 the old time, the, the, the way it used to be. Uh, we need to learn from that. Uh, I heard something from Reagan just yesterday that really, I forgot about it. Ronald Reagan says this. You love him or dislike whatever. But what he says is true. He said, every generation of, a, talking about Americans, uh, must fight for their own freedom. You do not inherit it. It's not in your blood to be free. Okay, if you want freedom, you have to uh, stand for freedom uh, in a free country, by the way. If not, it'd be taken away. And he, when he said that, I said, it rings so true. He said, if not, we'd be sitting around talking about how it used to be in our wonderful country. I think we're already doing that in some aspects. We're in a free country, and there is freedom. You have to stand up. You have to, you have to be a leader in, in these areas. But, but we realize freedom comes from the Bible, okay? Uh, uh, these inalienable rights that God has given his people. Uh, now, we are to respect those 
who are over us in authority. Amen? Okay. But however, uh, the Bible also uh, gives us a freedom of soul just because uh, Daniel uh, was, uh, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, just because they were, uh, uh, didn't bow, uh, they didn't rebel. Uh, no, they complied and were thrown in the fiery furnace respectfully. And God was glorified. You come Wednesday night, you see how that turns out, right? And that's, I don't want to get into uh, Wednesday night's message. But, but they were following uh, the Lord. And we need to be good followers. Why is that important that we are good followers and good servants? Because the fruit of the Spirit, He fills those who are obedient to Him, to the Lord. And that is love. How many of y'all want love? How many of you want joy? How many of you want peace? How many of you want patience? How many of you want self-control? All these come about, the fruit of the Spirit comes about when we obey the Spirit and do it His way. So if we are following Jesus and we are servant leaders, you will receive the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. An example, a lot of times I don't feel like visiting, but sometimes when I go and I visit, all of a sudden I get a certain energy I didn't have before, a certain joy I didn't have before, and that's produced by the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever found that true in your Christian life? You, you visit somebody or you're serving in some capacity. You are being a servant, not a being served. How many found you get more joy by serving than being served? Okay. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit will not bless you with peace and comfort and joy if you want to be served all the time. No, there's no joy there. But if you give of yourself... Uh, the Lord uh, makes sure that you have a full tank. So, for all the spectators here today, you need to serve somewhere. And you'll find the joy of serving, the joy of sacrificial serving. The Lord saved us to serve, and we need to follow the Lord in service. So, uh, kingdom servanthood follows in Christ's footsteps. It follows in Christ's footsteps. And Jesus was on the road to Jerusalem, and and uh, the disciples were following. That's pretty simple here. But uh, something was a little different about this. Jesus was walking ahead of them. Many believe that Jesus was so focused on Jerusalem and he was so focused on the cross that he was just kind of walking and speeding up and, and the disciples behind him, they knew he wasn't acting right in their eyes, I guess. They were perplexed and some were amazed and some were afraid. Here he's going down Jerusalem, and we're not going to know what's going to happen down there. You see a train wreck. They saw a train wreck coming, and, but they were still following him as he went to Jerusalem. You know, sometimes we need to follow the Lord, follow in his footsteps, even though we see there might be a train wreck ahead, and we're not sure how that's going to work out. In other words, if I follow Jesus and I share the gospel with somebody, will that get me fired? I'm not sure how that's going to work out. Or if I stop and help somebody, are they going to kill me? I'm not sure how that's going to work out. But we need, whatever we do, we need to follow Jesus. Or am I going to make a fool of myself uh, trying to sing at church or trying to teach a lesson or, or do something at church? Am, am I going to be embarrassed by it? How many ever had the feeling, right? But we still follow Jesus. We lay aside pride and say, you know, if, if my embarrassment is something God can use for His glory, then I'll be okay with that. The old phrase is, we need to be a doormat for Jesus. However God wants to use us. I see people all the time in a hospital. You know, nobody, you know, run the race that's set before you, but nobody wants to run that race where you're bedridden in a hospital. How many choose that for your mission project? No. You don't get to choose the race. God sets it before you. Nobody wants to be there. However, while you're there, people, even in a hospital, should still follow Jesus in the hospital. You say, well, what, what's your goal? It's like I talked to Doc uh, the other day. He called me and said, just let you know I haven't died yet. <laughs> okay. And we got to talk about him uh, going to Good Sam's. And we talked about it being a short-term mission project is what it is for him. You know, uh, not, just say, not just going to Good Sam's to get get better, but it's a mission project. God put him there. Uh, I'm sure he's going to be talking to some people. What do you all think? You know, uh, why did Paul and Silas get put in jail so they could talk to the uh, Philippian jailer so he'd get saved? 
Why was there great persecution in Jerusalem? And all the disciples went everywhere except the apostles. They got kicked out of town, lost their jobs. They had to run for their life in the first century. Why did that happen? Well, the Bible says they went everywhere preaching or sharing the word. Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, why did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and Daniel end up in Babylon? Uh, God had a big picture, but while they were there, he used them to, to present the word or to present the living God uh, to draw people for his divine uh, purpose. You with me now? So we follow in Christ's footsteps. Uh, we used to sing this song all the time, and some of you know it by heart. Uh, my mind fails me sometimes, but it's footsteps of Jesus. Remember, sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where that footprint's falling, lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. How many of y'all remember that hymn? Some of us could probably still sing it if you want to. Though they lead over the cold, dark mountain, seeking a sheep, or along by Saloma's fountains, helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus, you remember now, right? That makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Then it talks about just following the footsteps of Jesus wherever they go. And we need to follow in Christ's footsteps. That is kingdom servanthood. It's being a follower of Jesus first. Something else, kingdom servanthood focuses on Christ's agenda. Now, as they were following, they were concerned, they were afraid. And in verse 32 or 33, uh, he talks to them and he says, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So he tells his disciples, his agenda is, we're going to Jerusalem. And they were amazed. They were fearful. They were following. He was ahead of them because he was focusing on that. He's knowing what he's going to face. And he speaks to them and tells them what his agenda is. When we follow Jesus, we must follow his agenda. Not our agenda. How many of y'all got an agenda for life? Yeah. You have an agenda for the day. But really, we need to set that aside and make sure we're following the Lord. And, and we need to listen to His heart. Because we will see in a few minutes that the Lord gave His agenda, but the disciples let it just go right over their head because they were too bent on their own thing to think about what the Lord was doing. Yeah, here's an example. You know, God's agenda. What's His agenda going What's going on around here at this church? You know, on the church, it talks about a growing community. We have it on a sign. You say, well, preacher, we're not growing. We don't run what we used to do, so we're not growing. Now, wait, wait, wait. That's your view of things. That's your agenda. And I love to have the agenda where we're multiplying numbers every week. Wouldn't you? I love to have a packed building and have two servers. How I many of y'all would love that? Now, some of you probably wouldn't because it would take your seat. But anyway... But, but really, honestly, you know, it's not all what's cracked up to be. You know, you've been so used to COVID. If you realized how we used to pack chairs in here, you'd say, wow, we were packed more than we Anyway, I would love that more. But that doesn't mean God is not working. God is working. He, you know, there's more than just numerical growth. You know, there is uh, growth in, 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 uh, in uh, breath, uh, which is a growth in fellowship. There is growth in depth. That's a growth in discipleship. Okay. Uh, and so there's all kinds of growth. And, and is God not working? Yeah, he's working. Uh, people are growing. It's a growing church. You say, is it? Yeah. You just have to look around. I mean, you know, we've got ministries in a public school going on right now. Is that growth? Is God working there? Absolutely. Uh, there's uh, God working in people's lives as they, as they go through their daily uh, uh, grind, I guess you could say. Uh, God is using people to win others or to influence others for the kingdom. That's all spiritual life. You know, a church is a living organism. It's living. And it's going to grow one way or the other. Now, sometimes it shoots up. Sometimes it, it bulks up. But it, the growth is always taking... If it's not growing, it's dying. Okay? Let me ask you something. Are you growing in your spiritual life? Are you growing in your spiritual maturity? Are you, are you growing deeper with God? In the last year, have you grown deeper? Are you learning anything? 
Okay? Are you growing in, in, in depth? Are you growing in, in your knowledge? Okay? Are you growing in maturity? Are you growing in ministry? Are you serving more? Uh, giving more of your time, talent, and treasure in service, huh? Are, are you growing in your looking at life as it, you're in mission for God? It, it's all about a mission for God. A church is not something you do once a week. It's something, it's something, it's every day. You're living out your Christian life. See, we focus on Christ's agenda. Our agenda, I, I've been in churches where their agenda was to be white, middle class growth. That was their agenda. And we grew with kids. And the older people rejected that because they didn't matter. They didn't bring a whole lot of money in, okay? Uh, to them, that wasn't growth. For them, uh, uh, some churches, the only growth they have is people like them and their likes and their wants. In other words, uh, some of the seniors say, we're not growing unless I have all my friends coming in. Young people say, we're not growing unless I have all people my age coming in. Uh, some people who like a certain kind of music, we're not growing unless we're singing all this kind of music. Listen, let's focus on Christ's agenda. What's Christ's agenda? It's what's happening. You do all you want to, but what is happening is what Christ is doing. You can try to crank it up, orchestrate it up. You can't grow the church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So who we have is who we got, is who God has given us. And we need to love and grow together. Amen. We focus on God's agenda. If God gives us certain people, what's God's agenda for their life? I can tell you every time. God's agenda for their life is he wants them to, to believe in Christ. He wants them now to belong to a local congregation, a church, which is this one if they're here. He wants them to become a mature disciple and a servant of God. Amen. And he wants them to bring others to Christ. Resulting, bringing glory to God. That is God's agenda for every person that's here today. Now, the context in which you do that varies. You to believe in Christ, okay? Where are you going to believe in Christ? Well, right here is the goodest time as any. What do you think? Where, where are you going to belong? Well, uh, that's, that's between you and God. But if you're here, you ought to belong to the church you go instead of belong to the church you don't go to. That sounded kind of funny, didn't it? Oh, you, 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 wanna, uh, you want to uh, become a, a, a fully devoted disciple of Christ. Uh, focus on Christ. So what does he want you to do? He wants you to study the Bible. He wants you to study the Bible in community. Get to know people. You know, the church is, is a body, and we need each other. Uh, you get out in left field by yourself, you get wacky, if you know what I mean. Uh, accountability. You need fellowship, Okay. You want to belong. You want to be, uh, also become a not only mature, uh, stronger Christian, you want to be involved in ministry. That's what he wants you to do, right? Now you say, well, I don't see anything I should do. Uh, there's something you should have. God has something for you. It might be ministry to your neighbor. It might be ministry where you work. It might be Wilson School Ministry. It might be working in a Sunday school. It might be working in the nursery. It's working somewhere. It's some kind of mystery. But the, the thing is, that is his agenda. Now, what's your agenda? I know NASCAR begins today. I know that's an agenda for some of you, right? Okay. But my point is, we have our agendas, but true servanthood is focused on Christ's agenda. Christ's agenda is, if you're going to have a big game party at your house, and your neighbor has a need that you stop the party, and you go help the need in the name of Jesus. What do y'all think? Yeah, that's the thing. That is the agenda. So focus on Christ's agenda. Something else, though, Christ's agenda, of course, was to go and to die on the cross, right? His agenda for you is to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him, Okay? Deny yourself. What are you denying? You're dying. There's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh wants to do certain things. The flesh loves to eat. Amen? The flesh loves to gratify itself however it can. The flesh wants to do what's easy. Deny that and start doing what God wants you to do. But you got to eat. I know, but God wants you to eat in moderation. Well, you've got to have fun. Yeah, but God wants you to have fun as you serve Him in moderation. 
You see, we focus on Christ's agenda. We take up our cross, we follow him, and it's all about kingdom work and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Something else when we think of following Jesus, kingdom servanthood is accept where God has placed you. Now here's the point. Jesus had just told the disciples, he had just told them he's going to go die, didn't he? No sooner than he said that, James and John, the son of Zebedee, they're 35, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. I didn't know he was a car hop, did you? I didn't know he was a bellboy. You know, I didn't know he was like Santa Claus. You pull the chains. Lord, I want you to do whatever I ask of you. You know, you, you know you, they know he's got power, man. We, we, we've seen it. But now he, we want him to do a favor and... And that's, yeah, after he just says, I'm going to go die, they said, hey, will you do something for us? I guess what they're saying is, since you're going to die, will you do something for us where you go? That's not what they meant. They didn't understand that he was going to die. They didn't understand what all that meant. And so they asked that they could sit on his right and left hand in glory. And their thought was Jesus was going to usher in the kingdom when he got to Jerusalem. He was going to reign as king, and they wanted to be on the right hand and left. They wanted to be up there at the top. They, they, they wanted to reign. They want to have a lot of power in the new kingdom. They want prestige, and they want power, just like politicians do today. Is it about serving the people or about preserving their power? I don't know. You have to decide that. But we find Christ did not rebuke them. But because they failed the grass, he understood they were immature. They didn't quite understand and they were enthusiastic probably because they were going to Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom was going to take place. But Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. He asked his probing question. He says, are you able to drink the cup or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? Now to share somebody's cup was an expression in the first century of sharing their faith. What are you saying? Are you able to share the faith I face? They didn't fully understand what that fate was. Jesus knew what it was. He was going to die on the cross. And by the way, the cross is the most gruesome, painful death. You, on the cross, you do everything but die. You don't go unconscious. You hang there sometimes for days while birds pluck your eyes out, while dogs would chew on your feet. And it was a suffocation death. Slowly suff suffocate until you couldn't push up enough to get any more air. A slow, painful death. That's the cup that Christ was facing. And that's the physical part of it. We're not talking about the spiritual aspect of the separation of God turning his back on him and things like that. And he says, are you able to, to drink the cup? And then are you able to to be baptized with what I'm being baptized with. And the Greek usage for baptism meant to be overwhelmed by disaster and danger. An example, uh, the, the flood was called the baptism. That means the world was destroyed in Noah's flood. They were overwhelmed by what? Baptism is a picture of death. We've got two symbols here. We've got a cross and we could have an electric chair up there. You could have a, a noose up there. You could, you could have all kinds of ways people die. The cross in the first century was ugly. It was, they didn't want to look at crosses. It means to us the death of Christ today, but it wasn't a beautiful symbol in the first century at all. It was like having an electric chair or a gas chamber up there on the wall. Why would you do that? You say, it represents death. And by the way, that baptistry, oh, it's real pretty, but remember when you go under the water, you're symbolizing what? You're dying. So he says, you want to drink the cup, face my fate? And die the way I'm going to die? Of course, the disciples had asked, they said, we are able. You know, yeah, I think we can handle that. Not understanding. And Jesus said, yeah, you will be baptized with what I'm baptized. And what he means here in the, in the first century, those who followed Christ. If you remember, they died martyrs' deaths, didn't they? They were persecuted. So they will be persecuted, but it's not on the same level. You know, Jesus' death is at a different level than a, just a martyr's death. You with me? His death was salific. It saved souls. It was, it was 
a physical death, but it had more to it than we can ever understand. The sufferings of Christ, how can we understand a holy God uh, becoming sin for us? I can tell you in the Old Testament, the Passover lamb is symbolized, you was to roast it over fire without any water. Okay. Uh, the cross of Calvary, I'm not sure all the, the, the uh, sufferings of Christ, how deep they were. I know you just can't confine it for a few hours 2,000 years ago and say that was it. No, in the mind of Christ, can you imagine the, the mind of Christ from the time he was on earth, the born, uh, through eternity, he knew he would die on that cross. And being all-knowing, he knew the suffering it involved. And in the garden, my father, you know, my, you know in the garden, remove this cup from me. And on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But Jesus prophesied that the son of Zebedee, uh, James and John, would, would suffer persecution. Uh, but then Jesus goes on to say the, the, the place of honor is the Father's prerogative and not mine. And, and remember, Jesus on earth was a good follower. He was following the will of the Father. And the Father was going to who was going to hand out positions. And he's going to hand out the position for those who he prepared them for that. Prepared. Now, now here's my point. Kingdom servanthood is accepting where God has placed you and not trying to do an end run so you want to have power and control. That's prepared for people God has prepared them for, not for usurpers. Have you ever seen a usurper? That's somebody who wants control that God hasn't ordained or prepared him for, and they're power hungry in control. Does that happen in Christ's service? Yes, it does. It happens in the church. It happens in the world. Matter of fact, it happens in the secular world all the time. One dictator overthrows another. There's a coup d'etat. Everybody wants power. Political party, they want power. They want to control. And there's some here today, you just want power in your life of some kind, right? Whether it's at work, whether it's at home, I rule my cat, whatever it is, you, you, you're on a power trip. I know in the church some people want positions of leadership. And inwardly they just want recognition and they want control and power. I met men and women in churches who want control and power. And I always said the pastor's job is not to run the church. You've heard me say that. Pastor's job is like the referee to make sure nobody else but Jesus runs the church. Okay? And we, we follow the, the book, the, good, the rule book, okay? And what really ha people hate is when, when the whistle's blown. They don't like, never mind, they don't like that. Uh, I mean, does everybody love the referees? Nobody likes the referees, okay? They might like you this time, but the next time they won't, okay? But, but in, in Christian service, the message is these disciples want to do a little in run. They want to make sure they jockey for the highest positions in the kingdom. Okay. And Jesus said that's prepared for those whom God has, or that's going to be given to those who God has prepared. And it's not, it's up to the Father. See, our job now is just to be a good follower. If you're a good follower, God will put you where you should be. You don't have to manipulate. You don't have to step on anybody. You don't have to tear somebody down to get their position. You don't have to contrive it, connive it. No, God will put you there if you just follow him in humility. He will raise you and put you where he wants you. See, self-promotion, we find what happened is now when the group heard about that, they were incensed. When the rest of the disciples, they heard, hey, James and John were making a secret deal with Jesus. Okay, that'd make them angry. They were having a little deal. And, and so, so why did it make them so angry? Because they wanted to make their own deals, I'm sure. Remember, Christ was going to set up a kingdom, and many thought that kingdom was going to be one of, of glory and rulership, not humble servant, ser servantship, I guess you could say, or servanthood. Uh, they, they saw the kingdom as a political kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. They were beginning to understand it was a spiritual kingdom, but they was raised all their life thinking that when the Messiah come, it was going to be a political kingdom. So they joined the party and they, they thought that, wow, you know, one of these days I will get a position, a good position. But Jesus was teaching them opposite of that. Kingdom servanthood, accept where God has placed you. 
Don't try to be a leader over something God hasn't put you there. It's okay to desire leadership, but these guys were trying to manipulate, manipulate their way there. You say, who's in charge in the church of these things? In Acts, uh, the elders were told to feed the church whom the Holy Spirit has made them overseers. The Holy Spirit is who appoints overseers in the church. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit is who puts people in place in the local church. Deacons, pastors, all kinds of positions. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. You say, well, I've never heard the Spirit come out and say anything. No. Where does the Holy Spirit dwell? Here. And when we as a church, when someone is, God's working their life, we as a church recognize that and recognize their gifts. And we're the ones that say, hey, I think God is, is, is leading them and, and calling them if they're willing to do it. I think they will fit good there because the Spirit is confirming it in us. You with me? It's kind of like the young guy says, I've been called to preach. And they say, well, okay, you've been called to preach. We need to hear you preach. He gets up and preach. He, he said, how do you know God called you to preach? And he said, I saw a, a cloud spelled out a GPC. And it's got to mean go preach Christ. I want to do what he wants me to do. And so the church said, okay, let's hear you speak. And he, and he gets up to preach. And when they got through, the, the loving church, full of the Spirit of God, said, are you sure the Holy Spirit didn't say go plow corn? You can say, I'm called to do this or that, but the church is the one that's going to confirm it and going to grant you the authority to do it because of the Spirit to do it. you with me how that works today, huh? That's it. And so these disciples were trying to kind of do an end run, and the other ones were incensed. And then Jesus, the next point, kingdom servanthood is embracing Christ's model of leadership. And so he, he has a little talk to them. He gets them aside, he said, but whosoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. So now he's trying to teach them the, the character of kingdom service. The attitude you should have. It's not about controlling and being in power, having authority, having a job, having a position. No, who wants to be great? And the Greek word is megas. That sounds familiar, mega. If you want to be mega, not maga, it says mega, okay? If you want to be mega or great, okay, and that literally means superior in importance in context. If you want to be superior in importance, then you must be a diakonos. That's where we get the word servant or minister or the office of deacon. It's one who serves. So if you want to be mega important, then you must be diakonos, a servant, be willing to serve. Those who serve are who's important in the kingdom. Why? Because without Christ's service, there would be no kingdom. Would you all say his service was very important to the kingdom work? Yeah, through his service, he was a propitiation for our sins. He died for us, right? And you will be important to the kingdom by serving, not by commanding. Okay? Then it goes on to say, whoever will be first, the word there is protos, as in prototype, or protos means first or foremost or prominent. They must be a doulos, that's a slave, a bond slave. So basically, if you want to be important and great, you must be a servant. If you want to be most prominent, you must be a, a slave. You're a servant and a slave. The difference between a doulos and uh, diakonos, is, di diakonos is the one who serves. The slave is the one who has a, a debt or is a bond slave, one who is committed to him completely. So what he's saying here, if you want to be important and great in the kingdom, you need to serve. If you want to be prominent in the kingdom, be committed as a slave to the people you're serving. We are slaves of the Lord. Did you know that? Willingly, we're slaves of the Lord. He's our master. A bond slave is one who submits to the authority. I owe a debt I can never pay. 
I'm going to serve God the rest of my life. So the attitude of a leader is a servant and a slave. Wait, wait, wait. wait. The leader needs to command orders. No, the leader needs to get on his feet and wash, or get on his knees and wash the disciples' feet. The leader needs to, needs to tell people to do things. No, the leader needs to do things, and people will follow him in doing things. You should never ask somebody to do something you're not willing to do yourself. You lead by serving. Oh, by the way, did Christ just bark out a bunch of orders for us to do? Well, he told us what to do, but you know what inspires us to do it? He's the example. We follow him. So we should act like a servant and think like a slave. In other words, what can I do for you today? How can I help you today? I'm here to serve you. Okay. And by serving them in the church, those who are serving are the ones that people look up to. How many of y'all agree with that? You look around the church, you see people who are serving. How many of y'all look up to the people in the church who are serving, huh? Do you, you look up to them because they have a position? Hey, I learned this years ago as a pastor. You know, a pastor is a title, but actually the respect is earned. You can have the title, but I know a lot of pastors, they had a title that, adios amigo, right? <laughs> okay. But respect was earned over time in service. It's earned. And in the church, we need to embrace Christ's model of leadership which is service. Now, now, having a desire to be recognized by God is a good thing. Would you agree with that? It's a good thing. But the idea is, his idea here is that we serve our way to recognition, not seize it and abuse it. We find here wrong ambition causes people to jockey for position Wrong motives come from pride and self-exaltation. The great pitfall is confidence. When Jesus said to these guys, do you really want this? Exclusive right of God regarding ambition. He prepares and puts you where he wants you to, to be. Uh, conflict will happen, disunity, when people try to seize power in the kingdom work. It causes division in the church and conflicts. The means and greatness of good ambition is serving. I want God to say, well, please, that good and faithful servant, right? I want God to be well pleased. How do you do that? By being a good servant. A doulos, a slave. You're, you're meeting people's needs. You're trying to help them. You're looking for opportunities to serve in the name of Jesus. I know some of you say, preacher, I don't like the food you're sharing. Well, I'm just, a, I'm just the, the, uh, the server. You need to talk to the chef. Amen. God's the chef. I just deliver the food. Then, last of all, we wrap it up. Kingdom servanthood, of course, it's following in Christ's footsteps. It's focusing on Christ's agenda, not your own. Christ was going to die. We look at his death. You know, what, what's he about? Focus, except where God has placed you. you know, he's preparing you for something, but don't try to force your way. Let, let God put you there. Embrace Christ's model of leadership. I just need to be a, a slave and servant of all. Amen? In the name of Jesus. That's my attitude. I might have a position of leader, but my attitude is humble. Have you ever met someone famous? You know, they had a lot of money or they were famous, a well-known person. Have you ever met somebody, and, and not all the time, but sometimes you meet them and say, wow, they're just a humble, down-to-earth person. How many of you ever met somebody like that? Does that make you feel good? Yeah. It doesn't make you feel so good when they're arrogant and cocky and self-centered, does it? You say, wow, they're all about it. But, but, but someone who's at the top and you talk to them and they're just a humble, they, they take the time to look you in the eye and talk to you. And, and that just makes you feel good because you know, you know they're, they're genuine, I guess you could say. We need to be genuine in the church too. Which brings me to my last point. We need to understand Christ's mission. And, and this is pretty simple here. For even the Son of Man, even the Son of Man. The Son of Man was his favorite term. It's all about the Messiah, even the Messiah. Came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Wow. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and in the end give his life. Surrender his life. Die on the cross as a ransom to pay the debt we owe for many. We won't talk about the many 
tonight or today. We can spend a long time on who the many are. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guarantee you if Christ died uh, uh, particularly for you, you come to Christ. Amen. And the reason you come to Christ is because Jesus died for, particularly for you. You're one of those many. Okay. Everybody's been commanded to believe and those who do believe are the many. Okay. You got that? But we see, understand Christ's mission. And here's the problem. These apostles, these disciples, they didn't understand the mission. They thought his mission was, was worldly glory, worldly kingdom. No, his mission was to die for many. And once you understand the mission as a servant, guess what our mission is? Is to tell the news that he died for many. That's our mission. Understand the mission. It's not about bringing our own empire, getting respect for us or whatever. It's about sharing with the world that Christ died for many. Will you accept him? Understand the mission. Following Jesus. You serve people with love. That's how you win them to Christ. Amen. You serve him with love. And even... Many times Christians have been persecuted. Polycarp, Christian martyr, was burned at the stake, okay? But he wouldn't denounce Christ. You know, he, he didn't rebel. He just said, I've served him all these years. I'm not going to denounce him now. And they set a fire on him. He burned alive. But the people that watched him said he raised his hands and as if he was praising God, you know? Who knows what takes place at those times? We, we don't understand. But the mission is Christ died for many when you receive him. My question I want to close with today is, are you serving in Christ's mission? Uh, where are you at? Have you believed in Christ? Do you belong to his church, which is on mission to do this? In a small group by which you become, you grow in Christ. And where you start to become mature and you start to become a servant in the church or at wherever you're at, you're serving Christ somewhere. You need to be serving. Amen? Are you bringing others to Christ? You see, you're on mission. You, you're looking for those who are looking for Jesus. <laughs> are you sharing the good news? Whether in your example or verbal, you can do them both, one or the other, hand out the track, whatever it takes. I told you a few weeks ago about the... About the the letter I read at the hospital, a mama sent a letter uh, encouraging her daughter to accept Christ. And she couldn't read it herself, so I read the letter to her. And I said, would you like to do what your mama wants you to do? And she said, yes, I want to accept Christ. And she accepted Jesus right there. Oh, by the way, I checked her on just yesterday. She's still saved. I like it when they're still saved. Amen? And I got a letter from her mama. Her mama said she cried when she heard she was saved. And she says she's been praying for years. Her mama's in her 90s. For her daughter. And she said she, the kids used to go to church, but uh, the dad forbid them to go to church, and they all spread and went away. And, 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 and her, one of her sons died, but, but this was the only daughter she has left, and she accepted Christ. He said, what's the mission? The mission is just be sensitive and listen. And when be the opportunity, can I read a card? Yeah. Oh, mama says... It's the Holy Spirit that says, hey, preacher, Mama said she wants her to be saved. Why don't you just ask her? Oh, you want to do what Mama says? It didn't get any simpler than that. Just being there, you know. And when you hear an opportunity, you, you do it, right? And that's Christ's mission. And servanthood is who gets the glory? God. Amen. All glory to Christ. Where are you today? Are you a servant? The character of kingdom servanthood. Are you here to be served? I know you came today and said, okay, preacher, feed me. Preacher, bless me. Entertain us, singers. I want to feel good. No, 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 no. God is the audience. We're the servants. Was he pleased with your singing today? Was he pleased with your thoughts as his word was preached? Is he pleased with what you're going to do? Are you going to worship God by listening? Or are you going to worship God by doing what God's word said to do today? See, he's the audience. We're the servants. Are we going to serve? It's not about position of power. It's about service. 
So today as we leave, go and serve the Lord with gladness. Amen? And look for opportunities as a kingdom servant. Maybe you're here today and you've never confessed Christ. We'll give you that opportunity. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Trust in Him alone for your salvation. But that means you believe He died, buried, rose again for your sins. You believe He's the Son of God. And also you're going to follow Him. You believe in Him, so you're going to follow Him. Amen? You're believing in Him. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. You call upon the name of the Lord, invite Him in your life, and follow Him. Does that mean you're perfect? No. It means he's your Lord now, and you're the follow, though. And your followship shows the, the proof or the sincerity of your belief. Think about that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would uh, take the message, apply it to everyone's heart and life. And we thank you that you served. You so loved the world that you gave your only son. Jesus died. And he is now our Lord. Help us to surrender to him today and follow him and be faithful in that. And if some here who has not followed him, I pray that they would receive him in their heart, even as I pray, call upon Jesus. Invite him, in their, into, invite him into their lives. And may they come as we sing this hymn of dedication to confess publicly Jesus is now their Lord and Savior and they're going to follow. Bless this time of decision in Jesus' name.